talk because in, in my role as the YCIO and interim director, and now Marcus, who has taken that over, uh, one of the things we really want to do is focus on autoimmune uh, 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 issues and, and complications of checkpoint inhibitors, especially since we're one of the first institutions to use checkpoint inhibitors, and we've got some new ones that we're developing, and now, of course, we're uh, getting into other uh, combination therapies. So we're very excited to uh, have a special grand rounds where you have a full hour. You know, sometimes it's a half an hour and you have to rush, but now there'll be plenty of time for the, the, the speaker and for questions. And we're very fortunate we have um, Kevin Harold here today, who's the CNH Long Professor of Immunobiology and Medicine uh, in Endocrinology. And he's going to talk to us today uh, about mechanisms of checkpoint inhibitor-induced autoimmune diabetes. Uh, Kevin, thanks for coming. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Roy, for the uh, introduction, and thanks for the invitation to come. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as, as Dr. Herbst mentioned, I'm going to be talking about checkpoint-induced diabetes, and I want to give a little bit of a background on this because um, <clears throat> the, re the reason I'm, I'm sort of doing this uh, is because actually I'm an endocrinologist, uh, and, and that, that's kind of what what uh, got me into all this. So hopefully this slide is, is uh, probably most of you have this slide, um, but just to remind everyone who, uh, particularly those who don't, that uh, immune, immunotherapies that are targeting checkpoints have absolutely revolutionized the treatment of cancers. And the, um, the list of the cancers for which these are indicated continues to grow. It's very interesting because I was giving this talk at the uh, <clears throat> British Society of Immunology a month ago, and then while I was sitting in the audience, there was another indication uh, for uh, use of, of the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, another malignancy. Um, so this has absolutely exploded. Um, and some of the agents, of course, that are, that are used, I think, are very familiar to you all. But the, the problem with this, uh, this mechanism of, of, of relieving inhibition of, uh, of antigen reactive T cells or T cells would be that the same mechanism that would be presumed to kill tumor cells would also be expected to lead to uh, immune related adverse events. <clears throat> and it turns out that um, the endocrine tissues seem to be heavily targeted. Um, for reasons that are not completely clear, but nonetheless, some of the frequently occurring adverse events include, for example, thyroiditis that can be seen in, in, in even uh, uh, more than 10% of patients treated with checkpoint inhibitors, um, uh, which includes both hyper and hypothyroidism. Uh, hypophysitis is not uncommon. Uh, primary adrenal insufficiency has also been described, and insulin-dependent diabetes, which is what I'll be spending my time uh, focusing on during uh, during uh, this talk, so <clears throat> the the way this originally um, started was um, by going to clinic, and it turned out that um, um, actually Harriet had referred to me this uh, first patient, who was a 55 year old woman who uh, had metastatic melanoma had been treated with nivolumab um, as well as ipilimumab and prednisone, and then had presented to this hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and uh, her C-peptide, which is what we use as a measure of endogenous beta cell function, um, so just to recall uh, to the non-endocrinologists here, when the uh, beta cell makes insulin, it makes pro-insulin, and pro-insulin is cleaved um, so that the products are insulin, which is the active hormone, and C-peptide, which is essentially the garbage. But you can measure the garbage uh, very well with assays, and it reflects <clears throat> endogenous production of insulin. Insulin that you inject doesn't have C-peptide in it. Anyway, the, um, her, her C-peptide was essentially undetectable, which was certainly very unusual for adults who present with diabetes um, and reminiscent of the type of diabetes that children would get, um, which is known to, to lead to complete beta cell uh, destruction. Now, there were two things uh, that were unusual about this case. Of course, number one, it's unusual to see a 55-year-old woman presenting with new onset diabetes and ketoacidosis. Just doesn't happen very frequently. But number two, 
um, this wasn't the first time, and this wasn't the beginning of the use of checkpoint inhibitors. Um, we, we knew that this potentially could happen because we knew something about immunology. We knew this potentially could happen. We had never seen it before. In other words, ipilimumab had been in, on the market for a number of years, but we hadn't seen any cases of ipilimumab-induced in, uh, autoimmune diabetes. And then it turned out that actually there were um, a number of other cases <clears throat> that, that, that I saw, including patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer, renal carcinoma, um, and, and, and others. And then we, um, uh, you know, these things that were unusual about it, I mentioned to you, and we decided we would write this up. And, and this, this is kind of for, for the trainees here, this is kind of a, a lesson in, in sticking at it. So, so we, we put this series of five together because it had never been described before. And I, we sent it in to one of the endocrine journals um, and uh, <clears throat> it, gets, it gets reviewed. There's, you know, there's many, uh, there are many, many pages of, of comments from the reviewers and everything. And so, you know, we spent a long time revising this and responding to it and everything. And I, we sent it back to the, to the journal and the editor writes back and says, no, we're not going to accept it because one of the reviewers said, well, if this was important, we would have known about it. <laughs> so, so anyway, my, my message is, you know, don't ignore, you, you can't completely ignore the reviewers, but if, but if you think something's worth looking at, look at it. So it, it turns out that, that actually we ended up seeing a lot more cases. Um, and together with my colleagues at the University of California, San Francisco, we ended up putting together a, a more substantial series of these. And here, here are some of the clinical features of the disease. First of all, um, that we, we've, we have a total of 27. The average age of the patients is 66. The primary tumors that we've seen it in, most, uh, about half of them are melanoma, but I think that's really because that the first trials with um, the anti-PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors were done in melanoma here. Um, but, there, but there are patients who've gotten other uh, drugs as well. The, the number of treatments uh, varies. The median time to presentation is about 11 weeks, but it varies considerably. Um, about three quarters of the patients have diabetic ketoacidosis. And the random C-peptide is lower undetectable um, in 91%. So let me mention something about that. That's unusual even for the type of diabetes that kids get. When, the, when children present with autoimmune diabetes, they generally have detectable C-peptide. But in these cases, it appeared as, it, it appeared as though the C-peptide was either completely gone to begin with or rapidly lost, as I'll show you in just a moment. The average hemoglobin A1C is 7.9. Now, originally we thought this might reflect that, that it had been present for an extended period of time because this measures the average glucose over a period of about three months. But actually what I think this reflects is, is more likely the very high levels of blood sugars uh, when patients are presenting. The frequency of HLA-DR4 was actually, uh, uh, in our original series, was uh, over 70%. But when we went together with the uh, group at UCSF, it was 62%. It's still very high. In fact, it's higher than spontaneous type 1 diabetes. About half of the patients have autoantibodies. Here's their insulin use, which is pretty reasonable. Not really reflective of standard type 2 diabetes. More consistent with someone who is sensitive to insulin. And I'm going to come back to this again, that there's elevated amylase or lipase um, in about a third of the patients at the time of uh, diagnosis. Now, when we put together all of our cases, the rates of diabetes, and I don't, I don't know if this is because we're getting such great cooperation from all of you or because we're just looking out for this, but the rate that we saw was about 0.9% of patients who are treated with checkpoint inhibitors. Depending on who you read in the literature, some cases, some series have uh, described frequencies of about 0.2%, and some have described cases maybe a little bit more than uh, 1%, but, but that's generally the frequency at which we've been uh, seeing this adverse event. 44% um, had other endocrinopathies, thyroid disease being the most common because thyroid disease is the most common endocrinopathy. Uh, there were other uh, immune-related adverse events. There doesn't seem to be a very strong family history associated with this. We've never seen recovery. Um, and uh, I'll show you some cases later on where there's been some suggestion about ways uh, 
this might be treated, but it's still a little bit unclear. Glucose liability is consistent with an absolute deficiency. And as I mentioned to you already, it's only seems to be seen with anti-PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies. So here's another example of a patient seen here. This patient was treated with anti-CTLA-4 for his melanoma and then didn't respond. And so he subsequently was treated with anti-PD-1. And then we're looking at glucose on the left y-axis, it's fine, it's fine, and then pff, all of a sudden it becomes markedly hyperglycemic very quickly. His C-peptide, when he presented, was 0 0.39 nanograms per mil and then rapidly deteriorated. In fact, there is a case report that's floating around uh, describing somebody who was admitted to a hospital in Japan where they actually measured the C-peptide serially about every other day or so, and they could they could watch it uh, deteriorate. So very rapid loss of uh, beta cell function. And to sort of illustrate this, this is another patient who we've seen here, who uh, we put on a continuous glucose monitor. If you look at these curves, it looks like someone who has classic type one diabetes. They have irregularities in their glucose tolerance, in their glucose uh, management. So this is not a trivial problem. It's, it's, it's a significant medical issue. I mentioned to you <clears throat> this predominance of HLA-DR4. So we did um, do the HLA, uh, some HLA typing. And what you can see here again is in, in our series, about 76% were HLA-DR4. HLA-DR3 that's also highly associated with type one diabetes was not increased in frequency. And other alleles uh, didn't seem to be increased in frequency. And I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later on as to what we might be, what, what we think uh, put, could potentially be going on here, although this is still a matter uh, of uh, speculation. Now, we, we had the good fortune of <clears throat> getting some serum from uh, Dr. Haliban with um, three people who we had serum before they were treated and after they were treated with uh, the checkpoint inhibitors. And is the usual rule in medicine, a third do, a third don't, and a third change. Um, so here are three people who we measured autoantibodies before treatment on the bottom. And you can see that this first patient number five is negative before, negative after they get the checkpoint inhibitor. Patient nine is positive before, positive after, and patient number 10 starts out negative and then becomes positive. So it's not really clear as to whether the autoantibodies are good markers at all for this form of diabetes. Overall, about 40% of patients have at least one positive autoantibody. But the frequency of those who have two or more, which is what we associate with classic autoimmune diabetes, is only about a fifth of patients. So it's not the majority by uh, any extent. And frankly, I should mention to that this is exactly the same experience that people have had who've looked at patients who develop autoimmune thyroid disease. Now, is, there, is it associated with better clinical response? And the answer is we don't know, and this is all anecdotal, and it's primarily from our data here. But what you can see is that they in generally, they generally seem to do well. Here we're looking at those who uh, showed a response and the number of patients uh, uh, with diabetes. So it, you know, I think there's really a, a, a really a need to collect this data. But at least what we have so far would suggest that um, that they at least are doing uh, fairly well uh, in terms of their uh, primary tumors. Now, the the way we got into this and and part of the whole. Uh, interesting aspect of this when, you know, we first realized that, you know, there have been checkpoint inhibitors around for many years, um, but we had never seen this, was this work that I'll just sort of run, run through as, as background, really, uh, that we had done in uh, autoimmune, spontaneous autoimmune diabetes. And we used this model, the NOD mouse model. So this is the classic model of type 1 diabetes. These mice, uh, this inbred strain will develop diabetes at about 12 weeks of age. Um, and it, it, uh, the mice will develop insulitis, and there are a number of features about this form of diabetes that are very similar uh, to classic human type 1 diabetes. And one of the things that we had observed in the mice as they're progressing to diabetes, they present with diabetes beginning at about 12 weeks of age. So here we're looking at the, at the islet cells in mice at about nine weeks of age. And on the left is the NOD mice, and on the right is a normal B6 mouse. 
and we're looking at insulin staining on the uh, y-axis and glucagon staining on the x. And there are a couple things that are unusual about what's going on in the beta in the islands. First of all, um, the, the glucagon cells are unaffected. But if you look at the insulin positive cells, there's, there's less of them, number one. Well, that's to be expected. But in addition, <clears throat> the, mean, the fluorescence of the insulin staining here is a bit of a smear compared to the sharp population that you see in the B6 mice. Now, we had thought, and I'm not going to go through all the, all the work um, that, that took um, uh, a number of years, that the beta cells must not just be sitting there while this inflammation is occurring in the pancreas. They must be doing something to adapt to the inflammatory mediators and the cellular attack that they're seeing. And so we ended up uh, using uh, MIP GFP mice. These are mice that have uh, a GFP tag on, their, uh, on the mouse uh, insulin promoter. And so we can identify beta cells with GFP. And we had our control, we had control B6 GFP mice as well. And here all we're doing is we're looking at beta cells in the, um, in the islets that we're just looking at forward scatter and side scatter. And what you can see on the top is that there appears to be a population of cells that, that it has lower, um, lower granularity, lower side scatter that develops in the NOD mice compared to the B6 mice. You don't see it in the B6 mice. And the development of this second population seems to coincide with the infiltration of immune cells into the islets, which is shown on the bottom. We did a number of um, uh, genetic analyses of these cells, and there are a number of things that were different about them, including the uh, low, reduced expression of type 1 diabetes antigens, changes in their, uh, their, their metabolism, uh, the replication rates, death and survival of the cells, as well as immune, uh, uh, immune uh, signaling. And that's the part that uh, 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 struck our interest. But here's, here, first of all, are some changes in beta cells that we observed. Um, the, ins the, the, the cells that, 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 that are on the bottom we called them bottom cells. And the cells that are on the top, the normal cells, we call them top. So the bottom cells express less insulin. They reduce their expression of a number of the beta cell ontogeny markers, for example, MAFE, uh, NKX 6.1, uh, and so on. And they express a number of stem-like genes, um, uh, SOX9, SOX2, OC4, uh, and LMIC. They're not like real stem cells. Uh, which you can see in comparison to the gray bars, but they express more of these stem-like genes. Now, the thing that really attracted our interest and of relevance to this, uh, this question about checkpoint-induced diabetes was this observation. If you looked at beta cells during the progression to diabetes, they expressed PDL1, but they didn't express CD80 and CD86. And the expression of PDL1 seemed to coincide with the, the infiltration of immune cells uh, into the islands. And they also express some other uh, uh, immune inhibitory ligands, like the minor uh, class 1 MA, uh, uh, molecule QA2 that's found in mice. But, but the, um, the general notion from this work was that we had thought that in response to inflammatory mediators, stressed beta cells express uh, change in a number of ways. First of all, we thought that cells that don't change get killed. And secondly, those, the changes include increased expression of immune inhibitory ligands like PDL1 or QA2, reversion to a more stem-like state, and reduced expression of beta cell features. In other words, we thought that this was an adaptive response of beta cells to avoid cell killing. And so therefore, this whole thing made complete sense. We blocked this normal uh, a protective mechanism to, to shield beta cells from, uh, from killing um, with the anti-PD-1 or the anti-PD-L1 antibodies, and that's why they were getting killed. And that's what we thought uh, going into this. And so we expected, based on this, what we would find is that we would find an increase in the frequency of autoantigen, diabetes autoantigen specific T cells in patients who developed uh, this adverse event, right? Very straightforward, and as things usually are, not correct. <clears throat>
So what we did is we made class one MHC um, uh, uh, tetramers that contain a number of peptides that are known to be the standard, the usual suspects in type one diabetes. And these include, for example, a peptide from pre-pro-insulin, two peptides from pre-pro-insulin, the insulin B chain, another molecule called IGRP, IA2, and ZNT8, the zinc transporter that's found in beta cells. And we looked at the frequency of these cells, admittedly in the peripheral blood, of the patients who were treated with checkpoint inhibitors who did and did not develop checkpoint-induced diabetes. And that's shown here on the top, on the right, and we have as our comparison EBV on the bottom. And basically what our data suggested is there was no difference in the frequency of the diabetes autoantigen reactive T, uh, T cells in those who did or didn't develop um, checkpoint-induced diabetes. It was a little bit higher, although not statistically different than the healthies, um, but really no difference in the frequency of these cells. And the comparator EBV is seen on the bottom where there's no difference. So that didn't seem to, that didn't, that, that hypothesis was, wasn't, wasn't looking so good. So one of the interesting points, and I always kind of like this whole thing is because it really kind of emphasizes that it's, it's really worth reading the chart because there's a lot of information that may actually give you clues as to what's really going on with patients. And remember I mentioned to you that about a third of our patients, uh, originally it was a little higher, but then as we've gotten more, it's about a third, had an increase in amylase and lipase before they developed diabetes. And here's an example in A. Here's lipase. This patient gets treated um, with a checkpoint inhibitor. There's a bump in the lipase and then reds when they present with hyperglycemia. If we looked at the lipase levels in those who didn't develop diabetes or those who did, it was higher in those who did develop diabetes. Now, it, we, we, we had the, the good fortune of um, working with Gary Israel who looked at CT scans from patients here who had been treated uh, with checkpoint inhibitors before and after they developed diabetes. And what we found is that the pancreas actually seems to shrink um, after they get checkpoint inhibitors. And when, we, when he quantitated this, which is shown in the bottom here, um, it looked as though those who developed the checkpoint indu uh, induced diabetes had greater reduction in pancreatic volume after they got the checkpoint inhibitors. Now, we had the misfortune, I would say, of, of seeing the pancreas from one patient here who died with checkpoint-induced diabetes. And you can see in panel C on the top that there are CD45 cells that are clearly infiltrating even the exocrine pancreas in this patient. Um, there were a few islets that, could be st uh, that still could be found there. But there are, there are inflammatory cells that are infiltrating the islets consistent with this idea about inflammation occurring. And in collaboration with our colleagues at Columbia, we ended up looking now at both CD4 and CD8 positive cells. Chromogranin, it, this is on that same patient, chromogranin identifies endocrine cells. And you can see there are both CD4 and CD8 cells that seem to be infiltrating uh, the islets. Now, we then were wondering, well, what, what's the significance of this pancreatic inflammation? And we sort of took a step back and did, uh, you know, the, the, the experiments that are that are, that are uh, kind of easy to do, easy to understand, was we just set up mixed lymphocyte cultures of peripheral blood cells with islets. So these are MHC mismatched um, cells that are, that are and, we looked at, and we looked at what, what inflammatory mediators were produced in the cultures, particularly when we added anti-PD-1. And what we found is the gamma interferon in particular was greatly increased. And there are other cytokines as well, but gamma seemed to be greatly increased. And it turns out the gamma is known to be produced during pancreatitis. So this was all pretty consistent. And so we looked at what were the changes in beta cells that were exposed to gamma interferon. And so to do this, we did single cell RNA-seq um, and uh, analyzed the data with uh, this um, this uh, method that, that uh, Dr. Krishna Swami has, has uh, worked with called FATE, in which we're looking at the effects of, uh, we're looking at different uh, islet cell populations in the top left here. The beta cells are kind of in the, in, in the green and the olive color. 
Um, and then we're looking at them with or without interferon stimulation, which is shown on the bottom here. And you can see, if you look at the beta cell population, there clearly are uh, responses there. And we focused on that and looked at a number of genes that were, that were particularly different um, and, uh, with, with interferon. And, and among these included, interestingly, PDL1 as well as IDO. Now, this was really not a discovery of any sort because it was known that P that there is a um, uh, that that PDL1 is responsive uh, to, uh, to to gamma interferon uh, 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 and that there is a uh, uh, response element in the uh, in the PDL1 promoter. But nonetheless, it, what it did show us is that the beta cells indeed were producing PDL1, but also interestingly, this immune inhibitory uh, molecule IDO. When we look by facts, this also was confirmed, particularly when we also added TNF, another cytokine that's found in uh, pancreatitis. There was marked increase in uh, expression of PDL1 on beta cells and an increase in the uh, uh, transcript for uh, IDO. When we looked at that same patient who had died with checkpoint. Uh, induced diabetes. This is what we found. Um, there actually was PDL1 that that we could identify uh, in the islets of that patient, and IDO seemed to be expressed within the beta cells uh, of that patient. So um, there was pretty good evidence that these these ligands uh, were induced. Now, what? really was the significance of these PDL1 uh, positive beta cells. And so we looked at pathways that were induced with interferon gamma by the single cell uh, RNA uh, seq approach um, in, in beta cells. And interestingly, and much to our surprise, that there were there was an increase in these apoptotic um, uh, these pathways of apoptosis. Um, which was which was surprising to us because remember we had thought that this was all protective for beta cells, um, but then when we went back and looked at a number of other genes associated with apoptosis um, that uh, and differentiated the PDL1 positive and negative cells and actually did cultures to look at cell killing, we found that the PDL1 positive cells were preferentially killed when they were cultured with immune cells. So first of all, FAS is upregulated, as shown here, um, on the PDL1 positive cells, um, and, and also down here on the PDL1 positive versus PDL1 negative cells in, uh, that are cultured with interferon for three to six days. And when we looked at cell death um, by FAX, uh, this is beta cell death, we found that the PDL1 positive cells um, there, there was a greater frequency of late apoptotic or even dead cells and a lower frequency of live uh, beta cells when they were cultured with the cytokine. And then by, by morphology, if you looked at that at PDL1 positive versus negative um, uh, uh, beta cells um, that are cultured with interferon gamma, you get the sense that with the PDL1 positive cells, there are these apoptotic blebs that you don't see in the PDL1 negative cells. Now, why was this only occurring? You know, you'd think that this, this, this inflammation that we were seeing would be very nonspecific. Why did it only seem to result in diabetes? Or really, I should ask, did it only result in diabetes? And so by, the, by looking at our single cell RNA-seq, the alpha cells are shown here in, in this tan, the beta cells in green, and the delta cells in blue. You can see that the increase in PDL1 and the changes in FAS seem to be restricted to um, the beta cells. And in fact, the STAT1 signaling pathway, which is the response to the interferon gamma, seems to be preferentially activated uh, in the beta cells. And then when we look back in the, in the patients at glucagon levels, they were not different in those who did or didn't develop um, checkpoint-induced diabetes. So in other words, it appeared as though there was a preferential um, response of beta cells to inflammatory mediators that are produced during um, the, uh, well, I'll call it the pancreatitis that seem to be associated with checkpoint-induced uh, diabetes. Now, one of the one of the questions that we wanted to, to, to address is why, why do we only see this 
with anti-PD-1, why don't we see with anti-CTLA-4? Anti-CTLA-4 was known to induce uh, exocrine pancreatitis and inflammation. Why, why is it only occurring with anti-PD-1? And so we're sort of stuck here because we had to, and, and had to go back to a mouse, the mouse model. And so we did this in NOD mice. We took young NOD mice that don't have diabetes and treated them with anti-PDL1. And interestingly, the mouse recapitulates what we saw in humans. They all develop diabetes in response to the anti-PDL1, but not in response to anti-CTLA4. And when we look at the histology, there are cells that are infiltrating the islets to a greater extent um, with anti-PDL1 compared to anti-CTLA4. Now, we looked at antigen-specific cells in this model of diabetes because there are very robust markers to do this. And here's an example. We're looking at that these cells that, are, that, that, that these uh, mice that have um, uh, cells that are active to the diabetes antigen IGRP, we can see them very nicely here in both the pancreatic lymph node and the spleen. But if you look in the mice that do or don't have checkpoint induced, uh, that, that, that are treated with anti PDL1, um, there's really, really m mediocre numbers of these cells present, uh, even though these mice have diabetes. Here, as a comparison, is the frequency of these cells that have spontaneously developed diabetes, and it's very high. And the mice that are treated with anti-CTLA-4 don't have an increase either. So once again, we failed to find an expansion of diabetogenic T cells uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the animal model. I think the, um, the place that we've sort of landed on this is was suggested by this paper by uh, David Masopus. And, and, and there are some more recent data from uh, Donna Farber, where she's looked at tissue resident memory cells in a variety of tissues. And one of the things that's very interesting about, <clears throat> that was originally shown in mice, is that the cells, the tissue resident cells in the pancreas are PD-1 positive. Um, he describes this in his paper by staining with CD103 and CD69. But indeed, in the patient that I showed you who died of checkpoint-induced diabetes, we could find PD-1 expression uh, throughout the exocrine pancreas, and it seems to associate with the presence of CD3-positive T cells. So it suggested to us that, that rather than necessarily expanding an antigen-specific cell, that the resident memory cells are PD-1 positive. And in some ways, we had nonspecifically activated or un, uh, taken away the break on these tissue resident memory cells. They produced cytokines, and they ended up resulting, uh, it ended up resulting in beta cell death. Now, <clears throat> this would suggest that you might actually be able to treat this with something that would, would non-specifically block uh, inflammation. And this, this paper was published uh, a couple of months ago. It's a, it's a controversial paper, I would say. And I think the controversy here has to do with the patient, whether or not the patient actually developed um, uh, checkpoint-induced uh, diabetes or, or, or even uh, actually developed checkpoint-induced diabetes. So what happened here is this patient was treated with a checkpoint inhibitor and then presented with hyperglycemia, which is what this y-axis represents, and then gets treated with infliximab, the anti-TNF antibody, and seems to show improvement in uh, their hyperglycemia. Now, the other sort of... Um, takeaway point from this is what I'm telling you is that this is not a cognate interaction between T cells and their antigen on beta cells. I'm telling you that this is a nonspecific unleashing of tissue resident uh, uh, memory cells that are found in the pancreas. And therefore, I think we have to ask the question, is there any evidence for a real antigen specific effect here? And so we did this experiment in the NOD mice. We took NOD mice where we had induced um, uh, uh, diabetes with um, anti-PDL1, or we had um, induced diabetes um, with uh, uh, a regular, um, uh, that, that had spontaneously developed um, 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, we, we, we took, uh, I, I'm telling you the second slide first. We, we took mice um, that, that have been treated with anti pdl one and gave to them concurrently anti-interferon gamma and anti-TNF antibodies. And what we found is that actually, which is in the green, we could prevent the development of, of diabetes when we blocked both of these cytokines. Again, suggesting that they were critically important uh, for the development of diabetes. And then the other question is, is this a cognate response? And so we took mice that had developed diabetes either following anti pdl one treatment or spontaneous diabetes uh, that occurs at about 15 weeks of age. And we transferred them into NOD skid mice, right? So those are the effector cells that would be expected to cause diabetes. And indeed, and it's well known in this model that if you transfer uh, 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 splenocytes from a diabetic NOD mouse, you can transfer diabetes very efficiently to NOD skids. But we didn't do it when we transferred uh, splenocytes from a mouse that had diabetes induced with anti pdl one So it suggested to us that there is a real difference in the mechanism here uh, in these two forms of uh, diabetes. So, so the model here is that, 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 um, that, that um, there is actually activation of resident memory cells in the pancreas by the anti pd one or anti pdl one antibody that this nonspecific activation seems to make, uh, induce a number of changes in beta cells. Um, but these changes are seem to identify beta cells that are more likely to be killed by the inflammatory mediators. And then if you're HLA DR3 or 4, um, you go on and uh, uh, actually destroy those beta cells and develop hyperglycemia. Now, a last po the last point that uh, they haven't had a chance to, 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 to go over, but I just want to mention is sort of a work in progress, is why is it HLA-DR4? And I want to just mention that one of the known effects of the inflammatory mediators is to induce post-translational modifications of proteins. And so the question that we're now addressing is, do the inflammatory mediators actually modify beta cell antigens? Um, and if your HLA DR4 lead to peptides that preferentially bind that MHC complex. I think that's still a work in progress, but it's one of the hypotheses that we're working with to explain the uh, presence of HLA DR3 uh, or 4. So to, to, to conclude, autoimmune diabetes may occur in patients with cancers who are treated with checkpoint inhibitors. It's most common with anti-PD-1 or anti pdl one antibodies. There's evidence of pancreatic exocrine inflammation um, in those who develop this, the infiltrating T cells express PD-1. Beta cells respond to inflammation. They increase their expression of PDL1. And uh, there are other changes in the cells um, where the cells lose some of their features of mature cells. Fast expression and apoptosis are higher in PDL1 positive beta cells. And they're seen in the beta, but not other islet cells. And the activation of pre uh, pancreas resonant cells and the inflammatory cytokines they produce appear to be mechanisms that lead to autoimmune diabetes following checkpoint inhibition. There does not seem to be a difference in the frequency of autoantigen-specific T cells, but I would mention, of course, a caveat here is we don't know all of the autoantigens to look at. Um, but the reasons why particular uh, patients develop the disease still is uh, a matter of investigation. So I want to just thank a number of individuals who have who have done this work with me. Uh, Anna Pertigato is the um, uh, uh, fellow now who's, who's really done the heavy lifting with all this work. Um, these are other members of my lab um, who have been working on the project. I want to particularly acknowledge uh, the work of Dan Burkhardt and uh, Smita. Harriet's been a, a longstanding uh, collaborator on this, as more recently have Marcus and Nick. Um, uh, Marie originally helped us with the histology uh, Jordan with the anti pdl one I mentioned Gary already, uh, and then our other collaborators at other institutions. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I think that was wonderful. Um, we definitely have some time for some questions. Um, Michael. So I, I may be missing the point here, but I assume we're still talking about cell-mediated attack. And so... 
No, I don't know that it's I don't know that it's actually the same cytolytic T cell death that we would associate with type one diabetes. Inflammatory cytokines are known to damage, if not kill, beta cells. <clears throat> Yeah, no, it's a great it's a great point. No, the answer is no. I mean that that one patient's the only patient whom we have a pancreas on, uh, and it, uh, the pancreas is not in such good shape. Uh, that's exactly what we'd like to do. I haven't done it. So Kevin, you sort of mentioned it, and it was on your last slide. How can we predict who's going to get this? So, you know, I remember you know, a couple of our patients were profiled in the New York Times at one point. You know, incredible toxicity, and now that we're doing all this combination therapy and you know, uh, you know, multiple checkpoint inhibitor. Is there anything that we can do now, or uh, I guess, you know, how how should we start collecting samples? I know there's been this talk of building, you know, uh, a repository. Yeah, I mean, the critical thing is to have this is, is that we don't have is samples before patients are treated. So that would be absolutely, you know, my first pick. I think uh, in terms of what we need. Um, it tends to occur quickly, and the destruction of beta cells is fairly rapid. So we've been seeing patients when they present with hyperglycemia. I think that's late in the process. It'd be nice to get things before that. How can we predict who's going to, who's going to get this? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think we routinely HLA type people. If you did that, you would keep a more watchful eye out for those who are DR4. On the other hand, the rapid onset and everything uh, I think only suggests that it's worth looking at glucose levels carefully because, you know, if if we develop some new therapeutic approaches to prevent it, we would want to, you know, be able to institute that early. Yeah. So do you think it's independent yep. So that's what I'm thinking, um, that it's TCR independent. It's not that I wanted to believe that. We did everything we did to to show that that was that that it was that it was, but we just have not found a shred of evidence that it is. Is your impression that the distribution of T cells is more in the exocrine pancreas, equal between islets and exocrine, or uh, you know, is there something there's a target might actually be exocrine pancreas, and you have bystander effects in the yeah. islet. I think that's exactly right. Um, there, are, if if there are resident memory cells in the islets, there sure aren't a lot of them. I think most of them are found in the pancreas, uh, or at least the majority of them. Um, but again, uh, to to the other point, I mean, the inflammatory mediators are known to uh, induce damage to the islets. Now, you you might say that that can't be the whole explanation, and I you're completely right. Because people who develop chronic pancreatitis often more infrequently develop diabetes. So that's not the complete story. How things actually get into the islet or where the breach is in the normal protection there, I'm not sure. So in the one patient that died, we still saw islet. Yeah. Is that not many, but some. So are those the remaining beta cells that now no longer make so there were there were some they did stain positively for insulin, but it's nothing like normal. Uh, you know, there are some few residual cells. You would think that it's reversible, and yet beta cells are thought to be able to replicate during life. Is that right? So that would suggest there is a hope for a patient if you got them before they've lost all their Um. Well, first of all, I don't know if beta cells replicate. That's still, so yeah, it's a hope. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, and I also think potentially if this notion about it being sort of this non, you know, this inflammatory mediated thing is correct, there might be a possibility of intervening with something that would block the inflammatory mediators without affecting the anti-tumor response and causing their recovery. Reduce the diabetic complications. Is there any reason 
concerned about um, potential antagonism of the therapeutic benefits of the anti -check, of the checkpoint inhibitors, or are they completely independent mechanisms that shouldn't impact? No, I think that's an important question, and you're all better able to answer that than me. I, I, the way we had thought about that was as a sequential thing, um, because there is a there is a lag in the time. You know, the average is about 11 weeks, but there's a lag in the appearance of autoimmune diabetes after um, uh, the, the treatment with the checkpoint inhibitor. So the thought would be that if you saw some evidence of this developing, whether it's a modest initially a modest increase in glucose, that's when you would come in with uh, some sort of a uh, cytokine inhibitor, but it would be after the initial response to the drug. Let me just mention one other thing about this, um, that, um, that, that it's very interesting that, you know, the most common endocrinopathy, which is thyroid, um, th thyroid disease, I'll just say in general, there's the same, the same evidence for there's, there being thyroiditis uh, has, is, is found. So in other words, there's a very limited number of pieces of tissue that have been examined from people who've developed thyroiditis after checkpoint inhibitor. But what has been seen is basically sort of the standard thyroiditis uh, inflammation. Now, it's not completely like thyroiditis that we would see, you know, in a, in a young woman, because it, generally is associated with hyperglyce uh, hyperthyroidism followed by hypothyroidism. It just doesn't spontaneously resolve. But nonetheless, there's good evidence of, again, in the thyroid gland being the same sort of nonspecific activation of cells. Well, great one. Kevin, uh, one more question. Last one. <laughs> With, with what? The steroids? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been very reluctant to use steroids because of our concern about the anti-tumor effect. And, and by the way, that's exactly our feeling about the anti-TNF. I mean, it would seem that that's not a good idea um, unless we could do it sequentially. I can tell you that in, I think, three cases where they have been treated with steroids for one reason or another, it has not reversed the disease. Okay, well, people can come up and ask more formal questions. Kevin, 